Nathan Lane is a Broadway great who is experiencing yet another career high with a terrifying turn as Roy Cohn in the acclaimed new revival of Angels in America. Hear the well-loved star talk about the challenges of playing a monster in the epic play, what it was like to live out his own delayed adolescence in gay New York City during the AIDS crisis, and so much more about his 35-year stage and screen career on this week's Show People. Mr. Nathan Lane, I can't believe you're here. I can't believe I'm here. I, I promised you, gonna... you I would do this. I know. And here I am. You're a man of your word. I am. I have wanted you in this white chair for a long time. You are one of my uh, big gets. This is a big get. Is this is a big get? Yeah, this is oh, a big get I'm, for my career. I'm, I'm touched. So thank flattered. you. Thank you. And I've been... I've never, your hair, now to see this... We can talk about whatever you want. In the flesh, it's like it could be declared a national forest. It's <laughs> really good. <laughs> It is a great head of hair. You know, I've been looking for a good quote from you about my hair, so <laughs> now I have one. Thank you. Thank you for that. I have been a fan of yours forever, and it's actually intimidating to sit with you because... Isn't it? I know it is, but, but because there's... I'm terrified. I'm not terrified of you anymore. Good. I used to be. But there's so much we could potentially talk about, and we're not going to be able to get through it all, so I just, I'm just going to have to sort we of We could accept. do a special two-hour, like, actors I, inside the actor's studio. If you were game for where that. It's going, where it's going so well, they just keep filming. Yeah. You know, Catherine Hepburn and Dick Cabot. I yeah. just let it all out. Is that your worst nightmare, to have to do, like, a multi-hour interview? Not if you're having a good time, okay. if you enjoy talking cool. to the person. Well, hopefully the next half hour will be a good time. Yeah, I'm sure it will. So no doubt. you, sir, are back on the boards, and Broadway is always brighter when you, when you are here. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's true, though. That's, it should, you should always have to be I something. like when you treat me like Helen Hayes. It's well, very, very actually, sweet. I was going to ask you right when we started, how much ass-kissing are you comfortable with? <laughs> because I could go full tilt, <laughs> or I could tone it down. Yeah, just... You know, and, and smoke, too. We like a little ca ass kissing and smoke. But it's genuine. It doesn't mean it's not genuine. I know. Well, it's, you're very kind. <laughs> uh, well, Angels in America, though. Yes. I believe your 22nd Broadway show, that's what I counted. Is that right? Yeah. That, that, that's, that, that's, that's nuts, Probably right? true. I mean, I, it's, that's amazing. It, I've been around. Do you ever around. look at your credits and just go, whoa? I, yeah. Well, you do. I mean, when you reach a certain age... <laughs> There right. does come a moment. Well, you look fantastic, by the well, way. Well, you're very kind. Um, there does come a moment where you do, you, you look back and you say, wow, that's, um, I, I've, been, I've been around a long time yeah. and done a lot of things. I'm and sure I've Helen Hayes did that, very too. Lucky. She she looked... All the time. <laughs> she was constantly <laughs> calling you up and saying, come over, we'll discuss my career. Helen Hayes has a theater named after her, and I think there should be an Nathan Lane Theater. Do you have any thought about which one you would want to have? <laughs> the gaiety, but it's gone. <laughs> It's too late. That's an inside joke. These kids don't even... <laughs> These kids today with their yeah, crazy they don't even hair know. and their rock and roll, <laughs> they don't know about the game. <laughs> Look it up. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Oh, gosh. I can't even... I, that's so... That's too much to even think about. Okay. I'm, I'm going to say maybe the St. James. That was a big... The producers. Well, what, who was the St. James? Was, was that a, a biblical thing? What were they, who was that named after? I, I, you know what? Good Saint, question. Was the St. James. I mean, names like that should just yeah. be switched over immediately. Right. You, but you always find out they were, you know, some awful critic, or, you know, the Murgatroyd, you know. Why do they name it after him? He, you know, it's usually money. Money, money. changed hands. Mr. St. James had a lot of money. Yeah. You are fantastic as Roy Cohn, and I was really wary to see this revival because I had such fond memories of the original mm -hmm. production because I'm old enough to have seen it. Yeah. And I'm assuming you saw it in the early yes, 90s. Yes, of course. George C. Wolfe's beautiful production yeah. with that cast, an incredible, incredible cast. Incredible cast. So I, w I was wary going into it, and then I had such a, I, I actually got to see a marathon. Seeing it in marathon form was unforgettable, and it really built beautifully, and it doesn't feel at all like you're spending an entire day, but it is such it's a great. It's the best way to do it. But it is such a great experience. We feel like we're all sort of in the same thing together, and there's a lot of boat. breaks. You're in the same boat. In the same boat. <laughs> in the same yeah. boat. It's a communal experience. It's, it is about that kind of um, uh, investment of time, right. and and it's a it does bring out kind of the best in people. I think they yeah. know they're going to spend a lot of time together right. in this world, and it's obviously it's the more tiring version for the actors, but it's the most fulfilling, uh -huh. and you really feel that from the audiences. In fact, when you start the marathon day, you sense oh they're so excited about where right. we're going to take them, and and so I, I love those days, Mr. Roy Cohn. 
that there's a lot there. Yes. This is this is someone you take on a role like this, and and I read that you you read books about him. I didn't know he. I didn't realize he wrote an autobiography. Yeah, oh, it's hilarious. Is it hilarious? <laughs> or just fiction? Is it in the fiction worth, section? It's worth the read. The autobiography. It was co-written with this sort of questionable journalist, Sidney Zion, <laughs> because he was dying, and he knew he was dying, okay. and he tried to write it himself, and he, he wanted couldn't, to get his legacy so out. he hired Sidney Zion. And Got it. But you do get a sense of, he immediately opens his autobiography with a, uh, a, a talking about McCarthy and defending McCarthy, mm-hmm. and you right. know, he wrote a book about McCarthy. That's interesting, just hearing him talk about certain uh, parts of his life, but right. Uh, there's only really one book. It's called Citizen Cone, right. and that's that. That was the most helpful. Uh, it's very detailed, and it, honestly, there's. I mean, the interesting stuff is about his childhood, but the first chapter is all about the last two years of his life, wow. and it includes uh, medical reports, what he was going wow. through physically, and that really informs uh, a lot of my performance in Perestroika. Just. Uh, you know, want, I wanted to show this deterioration in yeah. a way that I felt I hadn't seen happen before and really watch someone die and who's fighting with every breath he has right. to, to stay alive and not be disbarred. Right. Although, you know, if anyone should have been disbarred. And, and he was, you know, brought up on those kinds of charges right. several times right. and always got away with it. You know, I, I've said I love being <laughs> Roy Cohn, but, you know, what I mean is I love playing this part yeah. it, because Tony has taken this contradictory, uh, screwed up human yep. being and created this fascinating mm-hmm. character. And, you know, with any of these so called monsters, Right. You know, and I played a few in mm-hmm. my career. You know, you always say, okay, I can't, you can't play that. You can't play I'm just evil. You know, he's, he thinks of himself as being on the right side right. and believes totally in what he's doing and why he's doing it. And so it's thrilling to play someone who's that, that uh, sure of himself. Mm-hmm. And then it's AIDS that stops him in his tracks. And I think ultimately AIDS is what humanizes him in a mm-hmm. way. And certainly when I talk to people and doing research, and, and it's easy to find the people who hated him. Right. But I wanted to talk to people who, who were fond of him. Yeah, who tell me about those were, people. Were, they were very loyal to him. Well, he was a very loyal friend. Uh-huh. Um, he was, if he, if he loved you, he would do anything for you. And he had a lot of power. So he could do, he could pull things off. Not other, just getting tickets to cats. Not just in, getting in tickets scene. to cats, although people like that about him. <laughs> you know, he was he was charming and you know, he yeah. was he you couldn't have gotten where he got to if he hadn't been able to charm and seduce mm-hmm. and and be funny. He was right. he was actually uh, funny. Mm-hmm. I mean, not so much publicly when you look at the and there's many, many interviews and right. so forth. And he seems, you know, he's kind of nerdy and and you know, lawyerly and polite mm-hmm. and you know, you don't see the guy who, when they discussed him, say his secretary, Susan Bell, who worked for him for years, who, you know, she recorded some of him, oh, wow. his conversations on the phone, screaming, screaming obscenities of people and being out of control. And, and uh, so it's, uh, you know, he's, but he's filled with those contradictions. Mm. Of be, you know, he's a self-loathing Jew, a self-loathing homosexual. You know, it's, it's just, and in the hands of a genius like, Tony Kushner, it's, it's a fascinating and, and thrilling gift to mm-hmm. be given as an actor. All right, we're going to talk, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to talk more about that self-loathing homosexual. <laughs> and we are back with Mr. Nathan Lane. Love having you here. Thank you. Uh, let's talk about Roy Cohn a little bit more. There's a whole segment of the theater audience that doesn't really know much about him. You're sort of bringing him back, and people are looking him up, and you know maybe they heard his name in relation to Donald Trump. Of course, he was a yes. mentor of Donald Trump. Um, yeah, he was his lawyer for many years right. until he died. Right. He was, in his mind, a straight man who had sex with men. Correct. I mean, that that was isn't that how he would define in, it in the doctor scene, the famous doctor scene. Yeah. Right, when he's uh, gets right. the AIDS diagnosis. Right. He won't he, identify as homosexual or gay. No. You know, it's the most brilliant way of of 
showing that mindset yeah. uh, that co Tony has oh, that scene hooked is into. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I know, it's as good as any, and, and you know, he's yeah. up there with O'Neill and Miller and Absolutely. Williams. I mean, that, and that scene in particular is extraordinary. And look, who knows what went on behind closed doors. Right. And w because he certainly had a, a lover at, at, towards the end of his life, this man, Peter Fraser oh, okay. from New Zealand, who he lived with. Oh, wow. And so he was capable of relationships. Now, he had been wildly promiscuous all of his mm -hmm. life. And he was very devoted to Peter and look, wanted to look after him and make sure he would be okay after he died, and once he knew wow. he, he was going to die. Um, but I think deep down there was that, the notion of, which really goes back to when he was a child, and that he would never allow himself to be that vulnerable mm -hmm. for people to know that he was different, that, that he was Jewish and that he was gay. Right. So he was never going to allow himself to be in that position. And, and in traveling in the world that he did of, of uh, titans of industry and, and mafia dons <laughs> that he represented. Did you ever see the 60 Minutes interview where he's in the, he's a, with uh, Mike Wallace? No, I, I read that. He did two of them, one with Sunday Morley Safer, which was a, a nice one. And then uh, just literally, Several months before he died, wow. Mike Wallace talked to him, and that's a fascinating interview. Wow. There's a one point in the beginning where they're just talking about him, and he's in the back of a limo with this mafia don, you know, two-ton Tony somebody, right. Salerno or whoever it was, <laughs> and he's saying, now, Tony, you didn't do these things they said you did, did you? And he says, no, I did not. You know, it's, it's literally, it's like out of The Sopranos. It's hilarious. You know, there's Tony's version of Roy and right. then there's the real right. guy. So and and it's interesting where they intersect and wh how he's taken all of this information about Roy and put it into the play and and even though you know he didn't die alone at St. Vincent's right. uh, being uh, nursed by a, a, an ex drag queen named Belize as in Angels in America. Yes. yes. Um you know it's it it touches on a lot of things and 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 um and really it's I think Tony's uh, it's all there in the text, you know, these tiny moments of humanity, mm -hmm. you know, especially as he's on his way out. And those scenes really are my favorite the, right. with Nathan Stewart Jarrett, this yeah. wonderful, wonderful British actor. The two who Nathans plays, are great together. Uh, oh, well, I, you know, I just love him. He's a wonderful young actor. And, and those are just, I mean, they're so beautifully written. I look forward to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the more, it's the, it's the longer play, it's the more emotionally draining play, but it's, I always sort of look forward to the, the, those mm -hmm. scenes. I feel like um, the younger gay generation now yeah. doesn't have the same um, understanding of the difficulty of the coming out process. Oh, right, so yeah. It feels like... Which is great that they don't. It's great that they don't. Yeah, it's an interesting thing to look back on. Yeah. And, and, I mean, you, know. you have cast members in Angels <coughs> in America who have given interviews about their fluid sexuality. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Some of your co-stars, I'm like, wow. I mean, it, everyone's yes. fluid. Everyone's fluid. Everyone's fluid. <laughs> are you fluid, Nathan Lane? <laughs> are you fluid or are you a gay man? What, <laughs> where are we on the, the fluid oh, scale? I'm, no, I'm totally gay. <laughs> I am totally gay. Right down to my shoes. You know, uh, you know, that's a great thing, but it is important to look back. As you yeah. know, and if you want to look back even further, in the, you know, as we did in the Nance, the Douglas oh, Carter Bean play, love that play where, so much. Where you know you're seeing that kind of world, and you know, that's that was a time period that Roy grew up. You know, right, where exactly. it was, it was, it was shameful, and it was, it was something you you hid from the world, right? If you wanted to survive, right? So, uh, look, there are kids today who look at this and they're surprised by the notion that it, AIDS was a death sentence, right? Right, you know? exactly. I mean, that the, what that meant in 1985 right. was it was terrifying. Right. It's a tribute to the play that it, it takes place in such a specific time and place, but it's so incredibly universal. Yeah. And if anyone was a prophet, yeah. aside from Prior Walter, it's, it's Tony Kushner, right. because it's amazing how prescient the yeah. play uh, is about so many of these issues that we're, we're talking about now. And now, in the, in the midst of uh, this insane political time where you know, democracy itself is under siege, you know, it's, it's more resonant and essential than ever. Mm -hmm. Moving to New York in the late 70s, right? 
you were obviously here during the worst time of the AIDS crisis. How the late yeah, and late you were, you were gay and, yeah. and dating in New York City, I'm assuming. And well, you I you know I let I had a very delayed adolescence. You know, I okay. was. Uh, I, you know, I, I didn't date anybody in high school and I, went, right. I, didn't, I didn't really go to college. So I just went right into the show business. And then in like the late 77, yeah, 70, early 78, I moved to New right. York. So that was, you know, it was a free for all. A lot of people that moved to New York at that time are no longer alive. Yeah, I no, mean, no, I'm, I'm a very lucky guy. But did you experience it with, with friends and did you experience Well, sure, yeah. yes, yeah. It was incredibly frightening, and that that feeling of you, if you got a bruise or something, right. and you and you suddenly thought, "Oh my God, is this it?" You know, and uh, and then it was, you know, there were people who, there were, you know, people who said, "That's it, no more sex," or the, and then right. people who were defiant, like Jeffrey, the, Jeffrey the right, the wonderful the the Paul Rudnick play, or uh, you know, people who were defiant about it and saying, "You know, I'm not going to, this is some sort of conspiracy, and I'm not going to let people tell me." how to live my life, and, you know, it's, it's, um, they were terrifying times. And, uh, and so, yes, it's a, it is a real history lesson for a younger right. generation to, right. to see this. And, um, uh, and, you know, and they should know this right. history. They, uh, what they do know is they love yeah. Nathan Lane and they love <laughs> a lot of your um, roles in the past. I mean, the birdcage is something I'm sure that comes up all the time. In fact, this morning I asked everyone, I said, what, what do you want to hear about Nathan Lane? Everyone's, everyone loves to talk about the birdcage. Yeah. I mean, the birdcage was a I huge, know. it was yeah. a huge moment. I remember when you right. got the birdcage, it was like, oh, you know, Hollywood has found something <laughs> great for Nathan Lane because, you know, <laughs> you know, when you see a great theater star get that moment, you were not out of the closet yet at that point. No. That, that came a couple years later. Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, it was sort of, I, I mean, I, I came out to my mother when I was right. 21 and, then, and, and to my well. family. No, that didn't go well. But I, you know, I, you know, certainly friends, uh, friends and, and uh, uh, my family knew. Right. And so, and I. And so I used to see you out at bars. Did you? I'm sure you remember me, seeing me. Yeah. Well, yeah. At the works. <laughs> You know, <laughs> hey, listen. I have. There's a long period of drinking and 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 well, yeah. uh, you know, as I said, I had a delayed adolescence. Right. So well, I'd you, like to apologize right no, now you don't have to, apologize to, to anyone, anyone. <laughs> uh, I might have <laughs> offended. Uh, right, you you were know, living an open life. Yes, certainly. Right. And then this had that movie happened, yeah. and which was a great moment, and and to get to work with those geniuses and, yeah. and Mike Nichols and Elaine May and Robin Williams, and yeah. it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And and then suddenly it was yes, I was thrown into this situation where I was being asked, at, uh, right. you know, at, at a press junket, you know, if I you know was gay or not, and I it was right. like. You know, and you, to a certain degree, you felt like, doesn't everybody know? And is there, do, right. uh, do I really right. have to make an announcement? And right. I also wanted it to, to be about the work and the movie. Mm -hmm. I finally get a, the le a leading part in yeah, a film. Of course. And I wanted that to be acknowledged more than sort of a coming out. And, and so I made that decision to, st you, know, the, 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 you know, you say, I'd rather not discuss my personal right. life. So this was in, ni was it 96, the movie came out? Yeah. So I said to Us Magazine, ask me if I was gay. And I said, famously, I'm 40 single and I work a lot in the musical theater. You do the math. What do you need, flashcards? <laughs> so was that not coming out? Apparently it wasn't. That wasn't <laughs> right. enough. Some people don't have a sense of humor about these kinds of things. So, you know, a, a year or two later, I did this, an interview with, with The Advocate. And then, of course, everyone scoffed and said, well, we already knew. Right. So That's a thing. fuck right. him. <laughs> so there was no winning. <laughs> There's no winning. Okay, yeah. we're going to take another break. We'll be right back with more Nathan Lane. Okay, we are back with more Nathan. I want to. I'm going to buy you a lizard or something. Okay, or a turtle, a large turtle to put I would in, love that. to put in here. I'll name it after so you. So that you know, if the interview isn't going well, <laughs> people can focus on whatever's in there. You're the first person to be distracted by that. A but hamster, something, <laughs> something. Should, you just feel like something should crawl up and look at you and blink and okay. look, and you know wink at you and then go back down. Speaking of pets, how's yeah. naughty Mabel? Oh, Mabel, dear Mabel. She's uh, good. She turned 12 in March. Wow, 12. She's still That's hard when very healthy. 12. Well, you know, she doesn't 
you know, sort of jump up on chairs with the same degree of accuracy <laughs> or run <laughs> up the stairs with the same sort of puppyish abandon. You know, she yeah. goes to the stairs and then she sort of looks at you like a little help. Um, she is your, your, your Frenchie and you yes. wrote some books with your husband, My husband Devlin. My husband, Devlin Elliott. Yeah, the wonderful Devlin Elliott. Yes, we wrote two books, Naughty Mabel and then Naughty Mabel Sees It All. My Henry's very jealous of Mabel's books. Oh? Every pet should have a book series. Well, not every pet, but... <laughs> <laughs> My turtle's going to get one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it was inspired by her. Whenever she would see a, a town car, a black town car, she thought it was for her. Because we, we, we would often take a town car to Long Island. We okay. have a house in Long Island. Yeah. And so every time she saw one, she would drag me to it as if, you know, she was late for a premiere. And uh, <laughs> I was telling Devlin this, and I said, we should write a children's book, you know, called Mabel of the Hamptons. Um, about an overprivileged French bulldog. Right. And so that's, and he thought it was a great idea and that's how it came about. I love it. Great. Did you think you'd be married when you were younger? No, never, no. How I mean, would it wasn't you? really part of the no. plan. No, nobody, right. yeah. It, was, it wasn't a thing. Yeah, and it was also, it was like, it was the, you know, it's like sort of what Fran Leibowitz says, you know, it's like, well, what's the point of that? <laughs> you know, isn't the point of being gay not to have to get right. married and do live their life? So what is the point of it? Because Devlin and I, uh, with certainly with some ups and downs over the years, but we're talking about 18 years yeah. now, 20 years, where finally, um, you know, we had been living together for over 10 years. In and, sin. And, 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 <laughs> and then said, uh, you know, yes, let's, we, and we, neither one of us were the types that yeah. said, oh, we have to get married someday. No, we could have cared less. Uh -huh. And then we talked, to, we were talking about it and said, yes, let, I'd like to do this. And I, and, and, um, and I was, yes, I'd like to do that too. And then we did it we, with these friends of ours, a wonderful comedian named Mike Birbiglia and his yeah. wife, Jen. We had been witnesses for them at City Hall. So we went to City Hall and I thought, oh, this is lovely. We'll do this and then we'll go have lunch. And, uh, Get it over and, with. And, and and then be on our way. And I uh, we got in there and I st and I started to um, say those words that you've heard in a thousand movies right. and plays. And uh, and I just totally fell apart. I was like I could barely speak. I got so emotional because it really uh, didn't hit me until then. And then it's a very subtle thing. It's a very subtle change that happens, and when you are able to refer. To to him as your husband and what that means, and uh, it's very, very emotional, and it's 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 uh, the best thing I ever did, especially you know because of him. Are you a romantic? <laughs> With him? How romantic? I want to know everything. <laughs> Am I romantic? I. Uh, you know, I try to be, you know, um, you know, it's important, uh, yeah. you know, when you've been together that long, you yeah. know. You to have to remind yourself. To you have to, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, look, it's the most important thing is, is that we are still are able to make each other laugh. We still laugh together a great deal. You know, it's, yes, it's, it's good. You, it's good you reminded me. Be, ro <laughs> be more romantic. <laughs> if I handed you a check for a million dollars, would you play Max Bialystok again? <laughs> producers, or two million. Is that the answer? <laughs> That's funny. Boy, did Mel Brooks ask you that to say that? He says it every oh, I don't know. Every, oh, really? Every year. He always wants he to says, bring it back. You know, if you wanted, you could always go back. You know, it's like, oh, Mel, please, I love you to death. But are you done it, with musicals? I s sort of feel that I am. Yeah. Um, you know, it would take, uh, I don't know what it would take. I, there was an idea I had, I was trying to develop being there as a musical. Oh, I finally watched that movie very recently. <clears throat> I loved it. And we were in talks about it, and then there was some, some difficult person at the estate wanted to control every note and every word, and, we, and, and Scott Rudin, I'm, you know, who's a good yeah. friend and um, the best producer yeah. in the world, was like, this is going to, be, he's going to make our life hell. Wow. And so I said, then let, let it go. Well, we're talking about things you might want to do. I, I got really excited when I read about you maybe doing Death of Salesman with Laurie Metcalf. Well, I can't stop thinking about it. Oh, yeah. Fact. Well, anything with Laurie Metcalf, I would do. I know. You're, aren't you the president of the fan Laurie Metcalf I fan am, club? I am. I am. I love her so <laughs> much. And, she's, and it's nice that Hollywood finally <laughs> recognized that she's a brilliant actress. <laughs> Something we knew right. in the theater yeah. for a long time. Yeah. But, um, yes. 
that's a, an ongoing discussion and probably wouldn't happen right away, but right. It, it is something that Joe Mantello, you know, we've since back, this is going back to the days of Love, Valor, Compassion, oh, wow. where he said to me, one day we're going to do Death of a Sailor. Wow, man. way back then. Yeah, and I remember he, we were talking about it and then of course he, you know, he worked with Laura, we, then we all did November that David yeah. Mamet played yeah, together yeah. and so he, and so he was saying, you and Laurie, and I said, well that would be extraordinary and then, and uh, I was feeling I wasn't old enough yet at that point. And then, uh, and then uh, not long after that, they announced that Phil Hoffman was yes. doing it, who was 45. Yeah. Right. So, and he, you know, and Joe wrote me and said, you thought you were too young. <laughs> so now, unfortunately, I am the right age. <laughs> so we'll see, you know, we'll see. It'll, it'll yeah, uh, but uh, I would love to. I would love to do that, especially with Joe, because really he's just one of the greatest I think it's amazing that back when you were doing Love, Valor, Compassion, which is before any of us, like theatergoers like me, really saw you take on these big roles now because, you know, you were the funny guy, right. you were the musical comedy guy, right. you were the guy next door in Frankie and Johnny, which I love, right. by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but that Joe back then saw that in you. Like, yes. you were Willie Loman. That's amazing. Yeah. Somehow he saw that in he Buzz, that in Buzz Hauser. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I've t talked about this, but it was really... It was during the Adams Family. I was having dis a discussion with Ken Branna one night after I had done uh, the guest role in uh, the play What I Wrote, yes, a show he directed, a, a hilarious little show. Yeah. And, and we were talking about playing these kinds of parts and expanding my horizons. And he said, you know, you just, you can't just talk about them, you have to do them. Those are the kinds of parts that change your life. And you will learn so much when you tackle them. Right. And so, during the Adams Family, Charles Isherwood wrote this piece about me, yeah. a really lovely piece in the Times. You know, and he referred to me as the last of the, last of the great yeah. entertainers. Yes. And I, I, I was flattered by it, but I was also like, that sort of stuck with me. Like, I, you know, I've been doing this for 43 years. I mean, I'm an actor. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm more than just that. Right. And, and, and I have reached a point, I had reached a point where I said, uh, is this all, you know, my Peggy Lee, is, this, is that all there is? You know, I, I, I feel I have more to offer mm -hmm. as an actor and I need to challenge myself and challenge the audience. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, that's what led to The Iceman Cometh right. in Chicago yeah. and then, and then it was, we did it again at BAM. That was a big leap. Because mm -hmm. it may be the yeah, next to Lear, one of the most difficult roles right. ever written. It, extraordinary, right. and it turned out um, uh, Ken Branagh was right. It was it was prophetic. I it changed my life. Mm -hmm. Well, we have to let you go. I mean, oh, I, okay. I, I, I could talk. To well, you now I've had now I just, I've had a really good time. I'm glad. And I'll come back, and I'm I'm going to bring you a turtle. Oh, promises, promises. <laughs> I, I would love you to come back someday. Okay, I will. Uh, everyone. Please go see Angels in America. I mean, it really is sort of a once in a lifetime kind of thing. It really, I mean, right. people say that, but it's absolutely true. <coughs> yeah. And yeah. you're fantastic. Thank you so and much. I, I adore you, and I just love everything you do, and, it, and you really bring so much joy to Broadway, honestly. Even when you're playing a son of a, a bitch. A hole. Yeah, like yeah. Roy Cohn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.